if the economy is really hitting a recession, if we get into official recession, we're going to blow way past 2969 gold. We may get to 23, 2400. Uh, silver will pop maybe into the 40s, maybe approach 50. Because this recession, I think, is going to be a deep one. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for January 10th through January 17th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature the 2022 Silver Krugerrand at 399 over spot, and the Valcambi Silver Kilo Bar at 299 over spot per ounce. For years, the Krugerrand was the most known bullion coin in the world, and in 2017, the South African Mint and Rand Refinery began minting a silver counterpart to the famed Gold Krugerrand. The 2022 Silver Krugerrand bear the Springbok on one side and the portrait of Paul Kruger on the other, and have a face value of one rand. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a monster box, they are IRA eligible, and are renowned for recognizability and design. Best of all, they are only $3.99 over spot. Next, from Valcambi, a Swiss mint known for producing some of the highest quality products in precious metals, we have the Kilo Silver Bars, which are 32.15 troy ounces of 3 nines fine silver, cast with individual serial numbers and a beautiful antique style finish. They are only $2.99 over spot per ounce, they come 15 to a box, and are IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. Our number for all orders is 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Robert Keints from Gold Silver Pros. Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Elijah. It's been a very exciting start to the year here with precious metals continuing their rally. Gold you know, well above 1900 and silver well above $24. Um, what are the main drivers pushing metals higher right now? Well, I think it's a few things, Elijah, and it happened probably about a month before I expected it to happen because I thought we'd get the retail sales data. Then we begin looking at the earnings reports, uh, fourth quarter, and also year end. It's very big the first quarter of a new year because you get those year end reports from companies. And so I kind of wanted to see how the economy was doing first, but it seemed like gold and silver just wanted to run. I mean, it got up last week and just said, here we go. We're ready to rally. And the, the fun thing about it, Elisha, is who's driving this rally. If you look at the commitment of traders report from the CFTC, it's the managed money and the wealthy individuals, the other reportable categories. It's the financial houses. It's the, the family offices. It's the hedge funds. They have are just piling in to gold and silver. I think they're at a ratio of two to one in silver longs to shorts on the COMEX, and they're almost four to one on gold. So they're very bullish on the, on the metals. And the bullion banks have have been trying to short it, you know, take the opposite side of that trade and short it. But the managed money has just stood up here and said, we're going to continue to pile long in the futures market until we can pile long uh, no further. When it comes to the managed money, like who exactly are these uh, players, do you think? Well, it's going to be a lot of financial houses. You're going to have that could be some ETF flow. It could be hedge funds, the financial traders, sort of the big generalist money that we really look for when we want to get into a strong rally. Exactly what we're getting. The generalists have come into gold and silver and they're the ones driving. It. It's really kind of exciting, I believe. And it does seem like typically after a rally this strong, um, there is a pullback. What are you expecting in the coming couple weeks and month ahead? I do expect a pullback, and I think it's basically the economic data. Now, I'm going to give a few caveats here. We did have uh, increased sales this year uh, for the holiday season, which is measured from uh, November 1st to the end of the year, those last two months. It went up 7.6%. However, you look at inflation, and it's been hovering around 65 to 7 So we've only got maybe a half a point to a point of actual real growth there in holiday sales. And a lot of that, Elijah, is on the back of credit card sales. Not to be too pessimistic, but credit card sales were $28 billion last month. The high of 39 billion a few months ago in the year, consumers are spending, but they're spending on the credit card. And so I don't think that the this is organic spending of people saying, hey, we're flush with new cash. I think it's basically they're spending for the holiday season, moderate increase from last year. A lot of it's going on that credit card and they hope to pay it off. I really think what's going to drive longer term gold and silver is what the Fed is doing and what happens with earning reports. So as we begin to get those fourth quarter earning reports, a few big ones are out this week. We get some more, and then we move into February and start to get those year-end 
reporting that we'll get uh, from corporates. We'll see how healthy they are. If they're basically living off debt right now, that's an issue for the economy. If they've seen enough increased sales and some additional profitability to where they can recover and start to buy down those debt balances, I think that we could be in for a short-term recovery. I'm not expecting that to happen. And just wanted to point out, the last time we had a big inflationary episode, this lasted for many, many years, and it goes in stages. But basically, when you have extended inflation, it typically goes in three stages. You have the initial wave of inflation, and then you have a pullback in deflation. You have another higher wave of inflation, and then a pullback and some deflation. Then you have the big blow-off inflation, and then the big crash tends to ensue. According to my research, we're sitting at the end of that first inflationary wave and getting that first cycle of deflation. That's why the CPI is coming down. And if you also look at economic data around small business, that index disappointed this last month as well. That index uh, closed lower than economist expectation by about two points. So that tells you the small business owner is not expecting a big rally right now. And that's where a lot of new jobs are created. So I expect jobs to kind of hover here for even for a little while. I expect the economy maybe to give some mixed signals. But I really think we're in that deflation stage. And I think that deflation is what's going to help drive gold and silver higher because gold and silver do well during inflation, but they do even better during deflation. And I expect that deflation to last probably throughout the year and continue to put pressure on the economic numbers, forcing the Fed's hand as to whether they're going to do the pivot. And I think there'll be a big pivot question here, probably somewhere around the beginning of the second quarter, where oh, uh, deflation's become apparent in the economy, uh, and some of those prices are coming down, that growth is coming down. What does the Fed do? Do they ease? Do they stop and just go to a neutral stance? I think we're going to see some pressure on the Fed here after the first quarter, you know, after we get those earnings reports, as the market says, hey, Fed, we may need to, to flip here. And it'd be interesting to see whether the Fed even considers a pivot. Now, you're talking about how this deflationary cycle is part of this larger inflationary cycle. So it, it seems like what you're saying is the what we're seeing right now is more a cyclical phenomenon than just a result of what the Fed's doing. So a lot of people are saying, you know, the Fed's doing great because, you know, inflation is coming down, but this seems more just to be, this is just how typically this inflationary cycle plays out. Is that your view? Yeah, the inflationary cycle, typically, if you look at the Great Depression or the one in the 70s, or early 80s, they go in waves. And so you go high inflation, then a deflation, higher inflation, deflation, higher inflation, deflation, three times through. So think of it like three cycles, inflation cycle, deflation, bigger inflation, deflation. And it goes like that until you get the denouement or the resolution, which is basically you have the economic crash and you have everything just cleaning out. Everybody's saying, we've got to get rid of all of our bad debt, so on and so forth. Well, along the way, the Fed is going to react to what's going on. And so they're going to see deflation. They're going to say, oh, economy's pulling back. Should we consider easing? Now, if they do, they'll exacerbate that and make the next cycle worse. So the Fed plays into what's going on. Now, if I know the Fed is smart enough to understand the multiple uh, uh, stages in an inflation cycle. It goes through three stages of higher inflation deflation cycle before you get the big crash. The Fed knows this. But what they're going to do is they're going to use those, cy those mini cycles within the big cycle, Elijah, that's going to last cu a couple of years to change their policy around to affect certain things. And the only thing I'm worried about is they overshoot too much. If they tighten too much and cause it, that deflation cycle to hit a little too hard, you know what happens there. But I think we still got some time before the big crash comes. I don't, I don't know if this is you know, the big crash in 2023. I, I certainly think it was a healthy pullback, but it wasn't the big crash. And I don't think we're going to see that big crash until we work our way through the cycle. But just expect it's going to take a year or two because that's what it's taken in the past. Now, again, when it comes to precious metals, um, coming back here to the metals, we're seeing on the physical market, something dramatic has happened over the last month or so where we're seeing premiums dramatically fall. Um, this is kind of unprecedented. I know Andy Sheckman has talked about this, the rate at which premiums have fallen. It, we've never seen anything like this before. What is your perspective on how, as we've seen the metals go up, for some reason on the physical market, the premiums for the coins and bars have, have dramatically fallen? Well, I think what happens, you've got some additional supply in the market. I think you've got some reselling. We saw that on the SLV, a little bit of silver come back in, a little bit of flushness of supply. As you get over $20 silver and head toward $24.50, $24.50 being a key resistance line. When it approached $24.50 last week, a lot of people kind of sold back into the market. That was one of their targets. It's a technical trading target. So if they had bought it years ago at nineteen twenty. It got near 24.50, boom, there's your sell. So a little bit of metal came back in the market. But I honestly think it's basically 
premiums rise and they'll hang there for a while and then the market reacts to it and then they come back. So this is a little bit of like a delayed reaction from the high premiums we had last year. The high premiums were a result of increased demand. And yes, we did have that. As some of that uh, metal came back onto the market, some additional metal was found, premiums came down just a little bit. Uh, we didn't need premiums to be that high for that long. But the premiums always come down in reaction to what's going on in the market. It's a it's a lagging sort of indicator of supply and demand. It's not a leading indicator. So I think that we had enough on the market to handle uh, what the sales were. And so the premiums came down just a little bit. And I think a lot of that started through as the wholesalers got filled back up in inventory from the supply chain problems. Because remember, part of the metals uh, strength last year was the economy and people flying to the metals. Part of it was a recovery in the supply chain, what we had during the pandemic. So I think you know, we're still short. If you still believe the Silver Institute, for example, on silver, they expected to be short almost 200 million ounces in 2022. That was a revised report that came out in November. So I still expect silver to be very frothy and there not to be a lot of inventory. And one of the ways that you can see that, and we just we put this out in our market uh, wrap every single week, we look at the amount of EAPs or the exchange for physicals. That you can find on the CME Group's website for both gold and silver. And what it is, is when an American position holder in the futures market goes to the London market, the OTC market, and is either seeking net metal or they're playing price arbitrage between the two markets and just trading the paper. I think the people are seeking metal. I don't know if there's as much liquidity right now on the COMEX as people want. People could be saying, I'm not delivering, I'm settling in cash. Because remember, that's the alternative. If, you're, if you get tied on inventories, on available inventories in that registered category, then you can start to settle in cash, and that will push people to EFP to go over that London market and seek out that physical. We're starting to see that. So I think that there is some price arbitrage between the London and the, and the Western markets, and I think there is still strong fiscal demand. But I do think when gold popped 1900 and silver popped to that $24 range, you did see some physical selling in there as well, and that includes on the derivative markets. Now, for a long time now, people have been talking about shortages in the physical supply of silver and, for example, Silver Squeeze, which started back uh, two years ago right now, almost exactly two years ago. Um, your perspective on this, because I know you've said that we are seeing Silver Squeeze 2.0. Um, so what if you can expand for our viewers um, what the physical supply of silver is and what kind of shortages we're seeing now or you expect to see shortly? Well, we were down, I think, uh, within the last couple of weeks, 11 million ounces of free silver on the COMEX and some registered category. Of course, there's a lot sitting in eligible, but that's private o ownership. We don't know how much of that is free to come back. It depends upon the owners and what their designs are for it. So certainly you could have a large amount of silver sitting there available on the COMEX, not many ounces available. So I'm thinking uh, free liquid supplies are somewhat constrained. Same thing in London. We saw you know, a lot have been taken off. Last I read was 840 me announces in London, a lot of it accounted for by ETF demand because all the ETFs basically, most of them parked their metal in the London market. Then you look at the Shanghai, they've been delivering a lot of fiscal gold and silver. So you can see that the fiscal trade is still frothy. And I think what's happened is we have drained inventories. And in stage two, it's where you get that fiscal, I think, drainage. And we've had enough of that, that there's, I think, Elijah, why we got the pop is people started to figure that out. I think we've been talking about this drainage. And I think more of the you go back to the COT report, the managed money in the family offices, the generalists are coming back in. And so I think what you see happening, that's what's booing the price. The generalists are now coming in. So you might have even seen some 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 old hands in the gold and silver space sell a little bit of their positions. But I think the newcomers are taking that and they're continuing to bid it. And so I expect what will happen. Premiums will probably rise again in gold and silver as this gets more frothy. But that really depends upon the earnings reports from companies. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. Depending on how the earnings reports are, that's the way the general economy is expected to go. That will affect the Fed. Then what the Fed does will key off or would tell the gold and silver investors what to do. I think the managed money is sitting there watching the Fed and they're watching the gold and silver markets and they're keenly aware of what's going on. If we continue to have any weakness in the economy, I think managed money is gonna to continue to pile in. And don't be surprised if we have a run, Elijah, because we're sitting at like 19, 16, 17. It's not far from there to the next all time high at 2069. Because remember last time we had this pop, it went through 1900 on its way to 2069. There's not a lot of resistance there. So this market get, get very frothy in gold very quickly. And if gold approaches its 2000 level uh, that we saw before, I think silver is gonna pop 
all the way from 20, you know, 24 range up to maybe 28, 29, challenging that $30 level. And it would not surprise me if the generalists are in here and if they believe there's risk in the market and they're not seeing rosy numbers, as we see in the bond market, the yield curve inversion, them saying risk, 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 then I think you'll see them run that, that gold price back up to 2069, that silver back up to 30. It could happen this year for sure, but it all is gonna depend upon the economic data, how the Fed reacts, then you're going to see the generalists pile into gold, silver, or maybe pull back a little bit from gold, silver. And that's why those economic reports are really interesting, because now you can see everybody starting to pay attention to that now. Hey, if you look at the stock markets, they were down last year. Gold, silver were even. The bond markets were down. Bitcoin was down. People are looking for alternative investments. If we continue to see weakness in the economy, they're going to continue to pile into gold and silver, I believe. I think a lot of people out there are looking at the metals prices and saying, well, it's risen quite a bit right now. You know, we might see a pull back. What is your perspective on this? People who are kind of on the sidelines looking to possibly purchase, looking to possibly wait for a pullback. You're saying it, we could see a pop, you know, to all time highs in gold and 28, 29 for silver testing that $30 level. So it seems very uncertain right now. Um, we can't give financial advice, but you know, maybe for the average person, kind of what are some of the principles they should be thinking about right now if they're considering moving right, uh, moving into metals soon? Yeah, I'll talk about the potential pullback since you mentioned it. Anytime you get really frothy in a market and you break a key uh, resistance level like 1900, it could sideways trade or even come back and retest that as, as support again. So you could see gold retrace back into the high 1800s again. And then if it does, the key to whether this is a, a sustainable rally is does it double top? Does it pop back through? If it pops back through and stays, then you know you have a strong rally. Right now, it's kind of a nascent or an early stage rally. We're not sure on the technical charts. We like to see it continue to stay above 1900. And the reason is, is we're talking about the futures price, not physical. And that's the way those traders trade that market. Now, if you're looking to get into gold and silver, I say, um, again, we're not financial advisors, but what I typically do is dollar cost average. I'll look for a little bit of a pullback on a peak and buy. Of course, I've been buying a lot lately because we had that pullback from 2069. So there's a whole cycle. You could have bought all the way down to like the high 1600s and where it popped back through would be a good time to buy. Is it a good time to buy now? It could be. I mean, you could look for some short-term weakness. Maybe gold pops back down to 1870, 1880, you know, before it retries. And if you want to wait for that, on the other hand, if the earnings reports come in and we've got a lot of negativity and, and generalists are saying, okay, I'm rotating out of stocks now, it looks like 2024 is going to be more of 2023, and you see that negative news, I would not expect gold to stay down for long. I do expect it to come back and retest 1900, at least on a daily chart. If we get extremely positive news in fourth quarter earnings reports, gold could fade back a little bit and have some weakness. So you really got to kind of see what those reports are going to tell us. So you have to pay attention to fundamentals. The traders do. And so if you see weakness in fundamentals, gold rise, I would say don't wait for a dip. If you see some economic strength in the numbers, you could expect gold to dip. That would be an ideal buying time. That's more on the trading perspective. On the long term, I say just buy whenever you can because you're going to dollar cost average in. Uh, be careful of just waiting for the perfect entry point. You may not get it. If the gold runs this year because of bad economic data, you may not get another entry point like this one. And again, that's the, the, the chance that you take. So really just pay attention to the economic data. Pay attention to your channel and our channel. We'll, we'll read out for the guys You know what's going on. It kind of gives you an idea where you think that, that gold and silver market could go. One of the things that people can also look at is what the big money is doing and also what the banks are doing. I know a few months ago, um, depending on how you read the data, people were saying that a lot of the banks were going long uh, gold and silver. If you can correct me, you can correct me off on that if I'm wrong. But um, I believe now you put out a video saying that they're actually going short. So at least for silver. So what, what are the banks doing right now in the precious metal markets? So probably the last six months of last year, they had positioned net long in silver, meaning they had more longs and shorts. And you can hold both positions. You can open a long, a short, and you just take the aggregate or the difference between the two, if you will, to see are they net long or net short, or how are they overall positioned across their portfolio. Since we're looking at the big groups of traders, it gives us an idea across the market kind of how that works. So for the, for the last six months uh, in silver, they had piled into the, the net long position. And that's one of the reasons silver began its run, because it was allowed to do that, because what had been short pressure was turning into long pressure. On gold, they had slowly increased their long position. They were still net short. So they were still had a more pessimistic view on gold. And that had changed in silver 
uh, where they had gone net long and they were piling into gold. So you thought, oh, there's momentum on the banker side. And I call the bankers the sharps because they really kind of know what's going on. They're the guys that play it for their own house accounts, where for the customers, they have all that trading data to kind of know where things are going to go. So I kind of follow them first and then I'll follow the other guys like the manage money second because it's not their specialty. They play in the market for speculation. They're not really uh, they're not the house. They don't understand as much how it works. So but what had changed was once the gold and silver price popped to start January, now the bullion banks are reversing and going short again. So now they're net short in silver. So now they're applying the short position. So that's why I said you could see a little bit of a pullback coming because it got frothy. And I think once it got frothy, the bullion bank said, it's too frothy. We're going to short a little bit, take some money. And so that's why I'm expecting gold and silver could even pull back just a tad here. It'll make the, the derivative traders a little bit of money on each contract. They'll make a few pennies on you know, thousands of contracts. They'll be happy. And then we could see the resumption of this bull market. But because of the, tr the positioning I'm seeing on the COT report, it looks like we could have a little bit of a fade maybe in gold and silver. But again, that COT report comes out in arrears. It's old. So we are only looking at previous week's data. So right now they could be piling back long and we wouldn't get that until next week. So that because that's a little bit of a tough report to read, you know, it's always in arrears. Uh, you're always getting that data after. So I think the fade that we've had the last uh, day or so in gold where it's kind of just even traded, that was the bullion banks repositioning. Now we'll see if they continue to do that and what happens in the, in the next few weeks. That's more of on the weekly trade side of it. Long term, however, it does appear to me that the market wants to go long gold and silver despite where the bullion banks are positioning and that's the big change this time is the trend is against the bullion banks at the moment because i think what people expect for 2024 and this is where the market can overwhelm the bullion banks and the derivative traders we often say that the market often overwhelms what's going on in in the in the trade and i think if the market really wants to go long and silver they can push that price wherever they want and the bullion banks won't be able to stop it and neither will anybody else all right. Well, Robert, thank you so much for your time today. What are some of the main things that people should be looking out for in 2023? Um, if you want to reiterate that for our viewers and also where people can find you online if they want to continue to track this with you. Pay attention to the economic data. This is going to be a really huge year, uh, Elijah, for the economy. If the economy is really hitting a recession, if we get into official recession, we're going to blow way past 2969 gold. We may get to 23, 2400. Uh, silver will pop maybe into the 40s, maybe approach 50. Because this recession, I think, is going to be a deep one. And so when it kicks off, you know, when you hear Bank of America and Goldman Sachs saying we're going to have rolling waves of recession, we're going to have big challenges, you know, in the bond markets and the stock markets. That's a sign that the big money kind of knows we're headed into this extended recession period. And we've had the frothiest stock market for 13 years that we've had in the history of the stock market since the last Great Recession. It's time for a big correction. It's time for a big clean out. And I think that's probably coming. So I do expect longer term gold and silver to continue to do well, even if they pull back on short term weakness. We'll have to see what happens there. And if you want to find me, just go to goldsilverpros.com or look up Gold Silver Pros on social media. They'll find us on most of the popular channels. All right. Once again, Robert, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you, Elijah. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. 
for your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.